All right, here we are with lesson four, more examples of functions. So our discussion starts in our journal. Again, take notes on what you feel is important that you will need to remember. There will be some additional uh, terms and definitions, so you'll definitely want your, your journal handy. So in the past couple of lessons, we've looked at several linear functions and the numbers that are assigned by the functions in the form of a table. You might recognize table A as the bags of candy compared to the cost, and table B was the number of seconds compared to the distance traveled in feet. So in table A, the context was purchasing bags of candy, and in table B, it was the distance traveled by a, mo a moving object. Examine the tables. What are the differences between these two situations? For the function in table A, we said that the rule that described the function was y equals 1 and 25 hundredths times x, where x was greater than or equal to 0. Why did we restrict x to numbers equal to or greater than 0? Well, we restricted x to numbers equal or greater to 0 because you cannot purchase negative 1 bags of candy, for example. If we assume that only a, number, only a whole number of bags can be sold because a bag cannot be opened up and divided into fractional parts, then we need to be more precise about a restriction on x. Specifically, we must say that x is a positive integer or x is greater than or equal to 0. Now, it is clear that only 0, 1, 2, 3, etc bags can be sold as opposed to 1 and 25 hundredths bags or 5 and 7 tenths bags. With respect to table B, the rule that describes this function was y equals 16 times x squared. Does this problem require the same restrictions on x as the previous problem? We should state that x must be a positive number because x represents the amount of time traveled, but we do not need to say that x must be a positive integer. The intervals of time do not need to be in whole seconds. The distance can be measured at fractional parts of a second. We describe these, uh, these different functions as discrete and continuous. When only positive integers make sense for an input of a function, like the bags of candy example, we say that it is a discrete rate problem. When there are no gaps in the values of input, for example, fractional, fractional values of time, we say that it is a continuous rate problem. In terms of functions, we see the difference reflected in the input values of the function. We cannot do problems of motion using the concept of unit rate without discussing the meaning of a constant speed. All right, let's take a look at example one. This is another example of a discrete rate problem. If four copies of the same book cost $256, what is the unit rate for the book? Well, the unit rate is 256 divided by 4, or 266 over 4, which reduces to $64 per book. The total cost is a function of the number of books that are purchased. That is, if x is the cost of a book and y is the total cost, then y is equal to 64 times x. What cost does the function assign to three books or three and a half books. Well, for three books, y is 64 times 3. The cost of three books is $192. For three and a half books, y is equal to 64 times three and a half. The cost of three and a half books would be $224. We can use a rule that describes the cost function to determine the cost of three and a half books. But does it make sense? Well, no, you cannot buy half of a book. Is this a discrete rate problem or a continuous rate problem? 
We should have said this is a discrete rate problem because you cannot buy a fraction of a book. Only a whole number of books can be purchased. All right, let's take a look at example two. This is an example of a continuous rate problem examined in the last lesson. Let's revisit the problem we examined in the last lesson, which is the water flows from a faucet at a constant rate. That is, the volume of water that flows out of the faucet is the same over any given time interval. If seven gallons of water flow from the faucet every two minutes, determine the rule that describes the volume function of the faucet. We said then that the rule that describes the volume function of the faucet is y equals three and five tenths times x, where y is the volume of the water in gallons that flows from the faucet, and x is the number of minutes the faucet is on. What limitations are on x and y? While both x and y should be positive numbers because they represent time and volume. Would this rate be considered discrete or continuous? This rate is continuous because we can assign any positive number to x, not just positive integers. All right, example three. This is a more complicated example of a continuous rate problem. You've just been served freshly made soup that is so hot that it cannot be eaten. You measure the temperature of the soup and it is 210 degrees Fahrenheit. Since 220 degrees Fahrenheit is boiling, there is no way it can be safely eaten. One minute after receiving the soup, the temperature has dropped to 203 degrees Fahrenheit. If you assume that the rate at which the soup cools is linear, write a rule that would describe the rate of cooling of the soup. We want to know how long it will take before the temperature of the soup is at a more tolerable, tolerable temperature of 147 degrees Fahrenheit. The difference in temperature from 210 to 147 is 60 de 63 degrees Fahrenheit. For what number x will our function assign to 63? Well, if 63 is equal to 7 times x, remembering that it dropped 7 degrees in one minute, then that means x is 9. Our function assigns 63 degrees to 9 minutes. Recall that we assume that the cooling of the soup would be linear. However, that assumption appears to be incorrect. The data in the table on the next slide shows a much different picture of the cooling soup. So in actuality, if you were to stick a thermometer in the soup at each of these minute intervals, this is the temperature that you would have gotten. Our function led us to believe that after nine minutes, the soup would be safe to eat. In the data table, this sh it actually shows that it is st still too hot because after nine minutes, it's still 158 degrees Fahrenheit. What do you notice about the change in temperature from one minute to the next? You might want to pause the video and take a look at this so that you can answer correctly. All right, hopefully you came up with, for the first few minutes, from minute two to minute five, the temperature de decreased six degrees Fahrenheit each minute. From minute five to minute nine, the temperature decreased just five degrees Fahrenheit for each minute. Since the rate of cooling at each minute is not linear, then this function is said to be a nonlinear function. In fact, the rule that describes the cooling of the soup is y equals 70 plus 140 times 133 divided by 140 to the x power. And again, do not try to figure out where this came from. This is not something that we are going to talk about. Just understand this is the formula that determines the cooling of the soup and how we determine this function is not relevant at this time. So this is where y is the temperature of the soup after x minutes. Finding a rule that describes a function like this is one, like this one is something we will spend more time on in high school. So again, do not waste a whole bunch of time on it right now. 
In this modular unit, the nonlinear functions we work on will be much simpler. The point is that nonlinear functions do exist, and in some cases, we cannot think of mathematics as computations of simply numbers. In fact, some functions cannot be described with numbers at all. Would this function be described as discrete or continuous? Well, this function is continuous because we could find the temperature of the soup for any fractional time x, as opposed to just integer intervals of time. All right, let's take a look at example four. Consider this following function. There is a function g, so that the function assigns to each input the number of a particular player and output, which is the player's height. For example, the function g assigns to input 1 an output of 5 feet 11 inches. The function g assigns to the input 2 what output? Well, function g would assign the height of 5 foot 4 inches to player 2. Could the function g also assign to player 2 a second output value of 5 foot 6 inches? Well, no, the function assigns height to a particular player. There is no way that a player can have two different heights. Can you think of a way to describe this function using a rule? Well, of course not. There is no formula for such a function. The only way to describe the function would be to list the assignments shown in part of the table. Can we classify this function as discrete or continuous? This function would be described as discrete because the input is a particular player and the output is the player's height. A person is one height or another, not two heights at the same time. This function is an example of a function that cannot be described by numbers or symbols, but it is still a function. All right, using the examples and the information from the lesson, Go ahead and complete the exercises. Check your answers as you go by continuing the video. All right, here are the answers to exercise one. Once you have checked your answers, continue to check the rest of example one. Here is the continuation of example one. Again, if, as you're checking your answers, if there's any confusions that you have, please make a note and bring them to class. This is the answers to example two, or exercise two. And here is exercise three. All right, let's wrap this up. We know that not all functions are linear, and moreover, not all functions can be described by numbers. We know that linear functions can have discrete rates or continuous rates. We know that discrete functions are those where only integer inputs can be used in the function for the inputs to make sense. An example of this would be purchasing three books compared to three and a half books. We know that continuous functions are those whose inputs are any numbers of an interval, including fractional values as an input. An example of this would be determining the distance traveled after two and a half minutes of walking. All right, we'll see you in class.